Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Space Snacks. And today I am with Derek Demeter. Hi, Derek. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's it's actually raining, pouring rain right now here in Florida. But other than that, uh, it's a oh. good day. Oh, yeah, that's too bad. I guess that's the problem with being so close to the ocean. And, yes. <laughs> and so thank you for coming on Space Snacks. It's great to see you. For those of you that are listening, we are both Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors, and that's how we met. I was 2016, and I believe you were 2017. That's right, yeah. But you were there when I when I was there as well. You that's were correct. actually meteorite hunting too and doing some other cool adventures. <laughs> yeah, I, I went back with David. And so, well, let's talk to our anybody who's listening out there. Tell us a little bit about you, Derek. Yeah. So, um, oh boy. Uh, so I, I work related. I, I run a planetarium called the Emil Bueller Planetarium um, over at Seminole State College in Florida. So I'm the planetarium director there. And basically um, the job that I have is pretty much what I always wanted. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, I, I, I was going to school for research astronomy, um, particularly planetary science, but uh, it just didn't it didn't uh, touch me as well as um, uh, grab me as well as, um, as, as education, learning uh, and also the creativity of the of the aspect of the planetarium. I can not only uh, teach science, but I can also create uh, videos and graphics and uh, and uh, all kinds of cool stuff, do creative programs where we you know we dress in costumes and you have puppets and so uh so the planetarium is a is, is a perfect environment for the personality that i am oh, and so yeah yeah and uh and i've you know i've always been in the space since i was a little kid my dad uh, i was raised actually uh in daytona beach uh which is uh you know for those that are familiar you know, that's where the famous uh daytona 500 is but you know daytona beach uh, right by the ocean right very close to the space coast so i got to see the at the time shuttle launches and and all that and i was just hooked as a kid uh one of my one of the things that i uh, was really interested in at a young age is uh just you know rockets and you know of course the space shuttle i remember have a picture of me i was three years old holding a, a you know a space shuttle orbiter i don't remember which one it was it was just one of the generic orbiters um, but I was just really interested in, in space since I was a little kid. And then when I was about six years old, my dad took me to a planetarium and I looked through the telescope for the first time at Saturn. And, you know, it, it just it, it becomes a, an, an addiction for the rest of your life. You just get hooked. And uh, and since then, I've, I've just been somebody passionate about uh, space sci and, and science in general. I, I'm pretty much of a fan of all sciences and, and like to explore all the different things in our in our universe. So if you could go anywhere in our solar system or beyond, but if oh. you, if you, would you want to go to the moon, Mars? Would you want to go to the ISS? Is there any place in particular that really resonates with you? Oh man, that, that is a really tough question because it's kind of one of those things. Oh, I don't like to be that person that says, Oh, all of them are great. Um, but, uh, I mean, Mars has obviously a really cool, uh, fun aspect. I think it's a little. I, I think I, I think it would be really also neat to go to Titan, uh, one of the moons of Saturn, because Titan has an atmosphere a lot of like the early Earth, and there's lots of ingredients for the potential of life on Titan. So, and I think Titan just kind of this cool thing. But the other reason, the other reason why I want to go to Titan is that since the gravity is so low on Titan, but the atmosphere is thick enough. You could actually build a astronaut spacesuit, have wings, and you can fly around like a bird. That's that's the real reason why I want to go to Titan because I want to fly around like a bird on, on another planet. <laughs> that oh, actually I mean, sounds <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I definitely would want to join you on that. But is there what would you want to eat if you could go to Titan? Being space snacks, oh, is there anything that you particularly like? Oh, well, I have a sweet tooth. That, that's, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I think it's funny because I always I always view the main course as just get out of the way so I can get to dessert. Um, so I definitely have a sweet tooth. So I definitely have to bring some, you know, some homemade. Uh, my wife is, is, is a baker, which uh, is very dangerous for somebody like me because uh, uh, actually since we've been under, uh, we've been doing the um, uh, social distancing, every... Um, weekend she bakes something new 
Uh, so the, uh, the other day, she made this really amazing, these lemon brownies, which are delicious. She made uh, my favorite yellow cake with chocolate icing. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Linzer tarts, all kinds of sweets. So I, I definitely would have to take a whole box, a sample of stuff that my wife has made. Uh, you know, the cookies, brownies, things like that. I definitely got to bring that with me. But if, if I were thinking about a main dish... Um, you know, I, I, I'm Italian, so I gotta get, I gotta get some Italian something, either, uh, you know, some type of pasta or uh, <laughs> pizza or something like that. It's gotta go with me. Um, uh, you know, but I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of methane, liquid methane on Titan. So I'm just trying to think, you know, are there any foods that have, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> something like gaseous, you know, like, like being, on, you know, like being on Titan, but, um. I, I can't think at the moment, but uh, but definitely, um, definitely, my ba my wife's baked goods are definitely coming on the spaceship with me for sure. Oh, now my next question then is, who's coming with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I don't know if my wife would be interested in going into space. <laughs> so my next thing would be my good friend Justin, who works with me at the planetarium. He's a space fanatic like I am, so I think we would have to go uh, to space together and explore the uh, the final frontier that way. Oh, it's always good to have a a, a wing wingman or a wing person with you, especially yeah, exactly. when you're actually going to be flying through the atmosphere of Titan. And so, going back to astronomy, um, you are big into astrophotography, and so right. one of the things what I remember when I got to meet you in Chile, and was that your first time go, seeing the southern hemisphere when you went to do the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassador Program? Yes, it was. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I obviously working on a planetarium, you can kind of see a virtual reality simulation. So before I went there, I, I set the planetarium dome to that latitude to kind of see kind of what I would expect. But, I, I you know, for those that, um, you know, are, are saying, oh, well, I could just I could just look at the southern hemisphere on a computer screen or something. No. Now, you need to go there and see it because I'm telling you, and, and si, I'm sure you would agree with me on this. When you see the Milky Way almost straight overhead in real life, it is just jaw dropping. It's just an incredible experience. And just how dark and how many stars you can see. And it was just so alien, too, because, you know, you don't see a lot of the constellations that you see in the northern hemisphere, uh, particularly the northern sky, like the Big Dipper and Little Dipper and, and those uh, groups of stars. It, it was crazy. It was just truly remarkable to see um, a, a whole new different perspective of our universe. And the thing for me that I was really excited the most about, and I had a pair of binoculars with me in a pack, was the Magellanic Clouds, which uh, yeah. for those that are watching are the um, two of the larger satellite galaxies of our Milky Way. Kind of think of it like galactic moons, if you will. Um, and, uh, and, and seeing that for the first time was Truly remarkable, uh, and I, it's something I've been dreaming about seeing for a long time now. Yeah, it really is um, kind of magical in a sense to see our, you know, the night sky from a different perspective. Because what it, what throws me off every time is the, you know, Orion upside down or the moon upside yeah. down, and being yes. like, it's so disoriented because you're like, you know, do I look like? How do I look at this? <laughs> And it's so it's so interesting too because the grass is always greener on your on your side, right? So, or on the other side, not on your side, on the other side. Um, and I was talking to some like like some of the people that were at Sierra Tololo, um, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the constellations in the sky, and they're like, "Oh, I would love to go see uh, you know Ursa Major is really high up in the sky," and all. And here we are, you know, for us that live in the northern hemisphere, that's just you know what we see every you know all the time. Um, it's just kind of cool to see how both sides um, yearn for something, you know, that we that we uh, that we don't see. And it makes you and it made me appreciate what we do have and um, and, uh, you know, how we should, uh, you know, instead of constantly yearning for something we don't have to really remember that there are people that would want to see what we see, um, you know, and vice versa. Um, so. I thought that was really cool to see that people living down there were, were kind of jealous of us seeing certain things and we were jealous of seeing things that they were seeing. So it's, it's kind of neat to see that. 
Was there anything that stood out culinary wise while you were down there when it came to food in Chile? Oh gosh. Um, we ate so much, so many, so many good, so many good recipes. I mean, the food was, you know, one of the highlights of the trip, right? Um, there was this really, I don't remember what it was called, but there was this like rice dish that we had at this one restaurant that had the sauce on it. And it was like a, like a red sauce. It was, it was really good. I don't remember what it was called. I should have remembered it, but, um, but I mean, um, even the food at the observatories was really good in my opinion. Uh, uh, when we went to Sierra Tololo, we stayed at the dormitories there and we ate the cafeteria. The food was there was a salmon dish, uh, and I'm a big fan of salmon. I love fish. I love love eating fish, and it was really delicious. I was like, "Wow, we're we're here up on this, uh, you know, mountain in the Andes, and, and this cafeteria, and this food is delicious." <laughs> you know, so um, you know, I, I think um, it, 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 even the breakfast. I don't, do you remember, uh, Simon? Remember we stayed at that hotel. At the beginning of the trip, there was that breakfast, and how it was just it was, they had all the delicious meats and the oh, cheese. Oh yeah, and it, it, I mean, it, the, I, I like to say that you know I, I also got a chance to go to Germany last year too, and just the quality of food, even in these you know what we consider hotels and things like it's just astronomically uh, different than what we have here in the United States, like the continental breakfasts, you know, the the eggs and the the right. Danish and stuff like that. But, you know, it, that I think for me, it was the quality of the food was just so much more um, amazing. We, we, we went to this place in Santiago. It was a barbecue restaurant. And it was just the quality of everything was just was was just dead. It was great. It was just, just you know, it, it didn't have it didn't feel like it had all those preservatives in it. It just it felt more. I, don't know, I hate to use the word real, but it, it the tastes were just were just more intense. Well, I, I found that as I travel a lot of those places, whether it's Europe or South America, it's a lot of the meals are prepared um, from scratch, like you're saying. Yeah. And so they're, they're, it's not um, any processed meats and food and all of that stuff. But I love the breakfast because it's more, you know, like you said, there's cheese and there's salads and there's olives and, and meats. And, and then you have eggs and, you know, all of the other kind of like traditional things that we have for our breakfast here, which reminds me, those of you that are tuning in and I'm a little thrown off because I see my name saying hello. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> uh, and so I don't know if that's somebody with my name who's just popping in and saying, hi, Cyan, I'm another Cyan. And so if you are, <laughs> tell me where you are. Uh, and then some other people, but for listening and putting in a comment, one lucky person will win a recipe postcard that I'll mail to you. And it is buttermilk pancakes. So Ooh. talking about breakfast. And so if you have, if you're listening and you have a comment or a question, just pop it in the chat box and we will get to that. But I want to get, Derek, I want to get to your love of astronomy and astrophotography. When was the first time that you took a photo of the night sky? Hmm. So um, <clears throat> I, I, the first ever picture I, I actually took, which was a really junky picture, if you think about it now, is I actually borrowed my parents' uh, film camera to, um, to photograph hale -Bop back uh, yes. in the late 90s. And it came out terrible. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't even know if that picture exists anymore. Uh, but the, the first time I really seriously got into uh, astrophotography was actually in uh, early college. Um, and that's when I had my very first true DSLR camera. Before that, I was using mostly point and shoot, but I was trying very hard to kind of utilize the certain limited manual things you got with the point and shoot. But really, when I, when I was able to get my very first DSLR, I really tried to do some Star Trail stuff with it, um, and um, and 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 when I was when I was a, a sophomore in college, I was able to finally hook up my tele uh, my camera to a telescope and got a shot of the Orion Nebula, um, and um, you know, you look back at that picture, and I remember I was so excited I, I printed it out and put it on the 
workroom, one of the, the, the physics workroom at the, at the college. And, you know, I was all excited. I, was like, oh, I took this picture of the Orion Nebula and I look at it and I'm like, my gosh, this it was so, so bad, you know. <laughs> but, but then you realize and you put it into the context of, wait a minute, I, that was my very first time. You know, I saw a little bit of the core, the trapezium, a little bit of the core, the Orion Nebula. And I was, you know, just super excited. And then, you know, um, eventually I um, finally had the freedom based on, you know, I have my own car and my own money. I had the freedom to kind of go and, and drive out to some more remote areas in the state of Florida and, you know, try to capture the Milky Way. So I was learning that. But it, really, when I got out of college and I had, you know, more time, uh, you know, to do these things, that's when I really got super interested in astrophotography. That's where I got the, you know, my first telescope and learned all the and watched a lot of videos and a lot of read a lot of tutorials and books on how to do it and uh and um you know it, it, it it's one of those things that you know I've, it just probably almost 15 years now since i took that that uh that uh, orion nebula picture um and uh, it's just amazing the growth that uh that you know that you've you've you that you can you can you can see you can see the changes in growth from taking that very first picture to the picture the pictures that i take now and it's a lot of trial and error uh people say well how do you do it you just you just got to go out you just got to set up a telescope and you got to do it well i'm gonna and show you know, i wish i had the original orion uh, <laughs> photo you took it. in contrast but i'm going to show this one yeah. and can you describe what's going on here i'm just going to pop off yeah so that is the um oh i think there we go uh so that is the uh hubble space telescope image of the uh of the orion nebula and this is i love this picture because it's kind of hard to see here but if you look towards the center top top center of the image you can see these little red specks and it's it's hard to really tell but the red specks are actually very young new stars we're talking only about maybe a million years old maybe even younger than that of uh, brand new baby stars and those stars are slowly cooling down they're they're eventually gonna you know they have their own little solar systems that are forming around it i just think that the orion nebula is this cradle of star birth and, you know, this image shows you all the colors that uh, help develop the materials necessary for planetary formation, star formation, uh, all wrapped into this beautiful area. And in the very center of the Orion Nebula is a bright area where we have very young, hot stars as well. And those stars are burning so hot that their, their, their energies are so intense that they're actually causing those gases that we're seeing to to get excited and when they they kind of re relax again they release photons and that's what we're seeing we're seeing um you know the reaction of these new stars causing this ga this nebula to to you know to em to emit light uh and it's just i think it's just a cool story of kind of the formation of uh, stars and planets and everything in our universe kind oh, of seen here in this, in this area i love that so you didn't actually take this photograph no, this, the, this one is yeah. This is the Hubble. Yeah, that's the Hubble Space it, Telescope. But I, I think um, there's an. I think you you uh, when we were setting up, you showed you we did have the image of uh, the one I took, which is uh, a little bit more zoomed out shot of the Orion Nebula. Um and uh, that ah. there it is. Yeah, that's mine. Um and um this this here um you know it took many many years to get to get to this level. And the trapezium I was talking about, which is in the center of the nebula, um, that was all I really captured with that that very that first time. It's it. It's all I captured is a little bit of gas glow around those bright stars. That's all I got. But I was able to finally, you know, by doing all these new methods and taking longer exposures, shorter exposures, combining them together to kind of create this dynamic range, I was able to capture the the beauty of this. A nebula and what's really cool is you can kind of see that the the nebula is almost like a cup you have this kind of swath of gas kind of coming off almost looks like a baseball mitt in a way um and uh it's 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 really cool to to not only in this this two-dimensional image to kind of get a little bit of detail and 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 kind of the depth of the nebula which is really really cool but 
Um, this is one of my favorite photos. I actually have this photo as my uh, wallpaper on my phone. <laughs> I like it. You know, the Orion Nebula is so iconic because it's a bright nebula. People can see it, you know, even in, in light fluid environments, you can, you can set up a telescope, you can show them uh, the Orion Nebula. Orion is such a famous constellation in the sky. People can identify it pretty easily. So the Orion Nebula is a great, great example of, you know, some of the interesting things going on in the universe. Yeah, I, you know, Orion is my, actually my favorite constellation. Um, is it your favorite constellation also? So, no, my favorite constellation is actually, uh, it's a toss between Scorpius, uh, because I just, I, I just love the, the, the arrangement of the stars in that, and there's some really cool objects in there. Um, but I really like the whole swap of, I call it the Perseus myths. So it's really Perseus, Andromeda, Pegasus. Uh, those, those constellations are kind of my favorite because there's this whole just beautiful story behind them. And uh, there's just so much to see in that part of the sky. Orion is definitely up there um, on one of my top constellations. But um, I just love the movie Clash of the Titans when I was a kid. I don't know if you remember seeing that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, seeing those constellations in the sky, they, it, it brings me back a lot of joy as a child watching that movie and learning about early Greek mythology. And that kind of mm -hmm. that movie kind of inspired me to to learn about the mythology of the Greeks and uh, eventually the mythology of the night sky and all that. So, um, so yeah, so that, that area of the sky is definitely one of my favorites. So we've got a couple, um, we've got one question. So Cyan is joining us from Hampshire, England. So I, oh, cool. I bet you pronounce it Sean though, and not Cyan. And so my counterpart, I have found. And then Justin says, do we know if baking works in microgravity? Good question. And so last year, they I know that they sent up a space oven and they cooked cookies, chocolate chip cookies on the ISS. And Derek, you being, you know, having a sweet tooth, what is your favorite dessert? If you could only pick one, what would it be? I, I know I hate to say it though, but I have to be I have to agree with the astronauts on the ISS. I would have I would have baked chocolate chip cookies too. A really good chocolate chip cookie has a really soft spot uh, with me. Um, so the perfect chocolate chip cookie for me, and again I'm being biased because I have an incredible wife that uh, makes all these baked goods, is I like a, a cookie that has a crispy edge to it. Mm -hmm. So you get that nice crunch when you when you bite into it, but then it's nice and soft and gooey in the in the, in, in kind of the middle part. You know, where you get that nice melted chocolate. Um, so I, I, you want that crunch, but you want the soft and gooey at the same time. Does that make so that so so that would be if I was an astronaut going to the ISS, I would I would ask them to make the cookies on the on the uh, space station. Uh, but also, you know, I'm, I, I am, I am, I'm a, you know, I'm a sucker for brownies too, like a nice fudge brownie. Um, I, you know, cookies and brownies, uh, it, it, it's kind of a weakness. It's my kryptonite. You know, if, if you, if you had to get something out of me, you'd be like, all right, well, Derek, well, we, we, we're going to make you these delicious brownies. If, if you could uh, tell, you know, be like, all right, fine. I'll have to tell you then, you know, so. Uh, but yeah, chocolate chip cookies. There's just something about those. I just like the the best, like best of both worlds, right? Um, so, no, does your it, does your wife is she into space? She uh, she's she's not in the space like I am. She's not like a huge space uh, space person. She appreciates space. Um, she's more in. She's more down to earth, if you will. She likes nature. She likes birding with me. We would go hiking mm. a lot. She likes a lot of stuff here on Earth, you know. So yep. she, we have a lot of in, uh, similar interests down on Earth. Uh, uh, her sister, though, my sister-in-law is really in the space, so uh, we we do have a little bit of that in common. Um, but uh, yeah, she's more more down to earth with when it comes to her interests. But uh, but she appreciates um, my you know my burning desire uh, for learning about space, and she supports that uh, wholeheartedly. We, you know, I love talking to you because both of us have a love for space, but we also have a love for Earth and Earth history uh, and fossils and just, I would say, <laughs> geo-exploring, getting out and exploring our amazing planet. 
And so talk to me about you as a geo explorer and some of the things that you like to do and have found. Yeah, so I am a huge rock hound geek. I know, Cyan, you and I, when we went to uh, some of the places in Chile, we were nerding out about some of the gypsum crystals and other things that we saw when we were uh, doing our hike out there. Um, and um, being from Florida, we have a rich layer of fossils. Uh, we don't have as much rock, but I'm going to show you all. I have some samples here on my desk here. Um, uh, there's not as much minerals here in Florida compared to say, you know, Arizona and other parts of the United States that have a lot of, a lot of really, really beautiful stuff. Uh, but we have some really interesting things. So all I like to do here is I want to show you, all, I'm going to flip my camera around and I'm going to show you all some really cool things. Cyan, can you see the, my, uh, my display yeah. here? Okay. So this right here is of course the iconic uh, thing you can find in Florida. This is a, uh, Megalodon tooth. And the megalodon was the largest shark that lived in in all of you know history. This thing could get up to about sixty feet in size. And these teeth, which by the way, this is the back of the tooth. The front of the tooth is actually here. These teeth were serrated. I don't know if you can see the serrations on there, but these are serrated because they actually were primarily eating whales. They were whale eaters. They they, they ate mostly whales. And so they would have to cut through the, the, the fat and uh, layers of the whale to, to, to bite, to, to, to hunt the whale. So that's why uh, megalodon teeth are, um, are serrated. But these, this is a fairly small one. Um, uh, they, these teeth can get up to six inches or more, you know, six, six and a half inches uh, big from the, the, from the root uh, to the bottom of the, uh, the tooth itself. So these are really cool. That is amazing. Did you, and so is that the largest one you found? No, this is not the largest, but this is the best quality uh, largest tooth I have. I have other teeth, uh, but this is the largest I have that I have found personally. I found this in the Peace River scuba diving, um, and uh, this is the best one I have um, of this quality. I have bigger teeth, but they're broken, and, and they're, not as, they're not as nice. And, I, and I'm about qual uh, quality over quantity uh, in, in a way. So this you right here. found it, just to, for a second, Derek, you found yeah, yeah. it scuba diving in the river. And so how right. deep is the river and how murky is that water? Yeah, that water is really dark. I had to bring two large scuba dive lights with me to see. So this was, uh, this Megalodon lived in a time period known as the Miocene and the Pliocene. That's about between 20 million years to about 2 million years. And back then, Florida was covered in water. Um, and so where the Peace River is, which is kind of in the middle of the state, would have been covered in water. And uh, these megalodons would have, you know, uh, uh, roamed around. They actually lose their teeth. Uh, sharks grow lots of different teeth um, over their lifetime. So this would have, it would have lost this tooth. It would have fell to the bottom. And then over time, uh, what happened was is the CCC... Uh, built a uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers built a uh, dredged a lot of the material from the Peace River and actually exposed the fossil layer. Um, so when you go underwater, you can actually dig that. And one of the things I also found this was actually in another river in Florida. This is a giant beaver incisor. So you know we think of beavers, right? Beavers, these tiny little furry creatures. This beaver would have been as big as a brown bear. Can you imagine a beaver as big as a grizzly bear? No, I can't. It's so awesome. Yeah. I love it. So this is a piece of, a, of, of the front tooth of a giant, massive beaver. Yes. And what's really cool is that um, in this river that I hunted, the minerals are much lighter. So you get these really beautiful oranges. And we call them Halloween colors because you got the, the, the black color here. You got the orange. So we call these Halloween fossils because of, you know, the colors of Halloween are black and orange. So um, I, I love co I love collecting these kind of colors. I, they're one of my favorite colors to collect. Now, did you know right away when you found that what it was? I, I did, yes, because I have a, I actually have a book that I read called Florida, uh, Florida Vertebrate Fossils. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I, you know, I was familiar with beaver incisors anyways. And. Um, but there's a, there's a guy that at the university of Florida, if you don't know a fossil, you can actually send him a picture and, and he'll send you a reply back. So there have been some fossils I found, um, that, um, I don't know what they are and I'll send him a photo 
uh, Dr. Holbert is his name. Um, and uh, you can actually have him identify your fossils. Wow. What I want to show you next is, so this right here is a piece of coral that back a long time ago, about 30 million years ago, Florida had these coral reefs everywhere. But because of the Appalachian Mountains weathering down, it brought a lot of silica. And over time, when these corals fell to the bottom of the ocean, they were replaced by silica. And wait till you see the other side of this. It's called agatized coral. Wait, hold on. Let's see if I can get in the light wow, here. Wow, that is awesome. So, it's hollow, but I'm trying to see if I can get the sparkle. Can you see the sparkle? Yes, I can. Yeah, so those are little quartz crystals inside of this coral. So I had this cut and polished. You can see here. Um, there we go. Uh, let me see if I can get a focus. You can see kind of the agate banding on the on the edges here. So I thought that's pretty cool. And my last fossil I want to show you is that this is a whelk, fossilized whelk. You can see you can see the whelk shape, but look what's inside of it. These are large calcite crystals that have grown. What happened was when this whelk died, it was closed and calcium carbonate um, filled in this void and created a perfect, uh, perfect uh, conditions for crystal growth of calcite. So you get these beautiful, beautiful calcite crystals that are growing inside of this fossilized whelk, about 2 million years old. So, yeah, so those are some of the fossils that I've, I've collected. I got a lot of them, but uh, that's some of them that I've, you know, and that's just in Florida. So there's, I want to show you all some of the cool things I find in Florida, but there's a lot of other cool minerals you can collect all over the world. That is awesome. So when you're <laughs> Uh, how is it loose sediment down on the uh, bottom of the ocean, uh, not ocean, the um, river floor that you're kind of digging in and sieving through? Or is it actually kind of harder rock of, of um, limestone deposits? It's actually clay. It's a more of a clay material. Okay. And um, we, um, and of course, you know, as you know, with Mars, you know, we find clays on Mars. That's a good end indicator that there was presence of water there, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, those clays, uh, if you actually break off chunks of this clay, you'll actually see shell impressions in them, uh, like seashell impressions. So we know that this used to be an ancient uh, seafloor. So could you imagine, like, for example, Perseverance, it's going to be coming to Mars here soon. Could you imagine if it were to pick up a chunk of clay and see an impression of some type of life form. Wouldn't that be that incredible? That's what we're all hoping for. <laughs> That's what we're all hoping for, exactly. So um, so the same thing with, with these. So you're actually painting into this clay and uh, the teeth are embedded in the clay. Now, sometimes uh, due to the, the, the current of the river or if there's rain, if there's an exposed clay layer above the river, that clay will erode and then the fossils will pop out and they'll create these gravel beds. And a lot of times people who fossil hunt that aren't scuba dive, scuba trained, will actually take a, sub, a shovel and, 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 and uh, a dig into that gravel bed, and then they'll sift through the gravel to find fossils that way. But the most, in my opinion, the most well-preserved fossils are the ones that are coming out of the clay that haven't been tumbled by the river, things like that. So that's one of the advantages of scuba diving versus uh, just digging with a shovel and sifting is that you tend to find higher quality fossils because they haven't been um, knocked around and things like that uh, because of the uh, of the uh, river and stuff like that. Oh, that's that's really awesome and fantastic. And so I'm um, looking at the comments here. Um, Justin says he wants an ISS cookie. <laughs> and then Ethan, thanks for joining in. Um, Tanisha is watching right now, and you're watching The Colony. Appreciate that, Colony Season nice. 2. And so all of those that are leaving a comment, you're in the running for today's recipe postcard. Derek, I can't believe it's already been over a half hour. It's been Time so Time flies crazy. when you're having fun, you know? <laughs> I can't wait to come visit you. I want to ask you um, one really last question, and that's the launch. Did you watch the launch? I did. Yeah. So um, I, uh, you know, being in Florida, I have a kayak and uh, there are a few places I went kind of um, near there that I, I, there's a certain, there's a couple of maps you can look up and you can see where you can legally be in the water. 
Uh, you can't get too close because then you're you're in restricted uh, space. Um, but uh, yeah, I went and, and set up my kayak and I just floated in the water and I watched the launch, got some pictures of it. Uh, not as good as some of my friends have. I had a couple friends that were actually out at the Cape that uh, got really, really lucky and got access. They were really limiting. Our ability yeah. to uh, go, I know uh, Justin and I, Justin uh, works at me at the planetarium. Uh, both of us had approval to go to Kennedy Space Center to photograph it but due to the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Um, we were uh, unfortunately unable to go, but some of my friends still got to go. But seeing it through the binoculars, it was, you know, I mean, it's a Falcon 9 rocket. You know, I mean, it, it, I've seen many Falcon 9 launches, but knowing that there are people in there, uh just made it so much more exciting you know um it's just amazing how when you put two when you put humans in a spacecraft it ups the the, the wow factor right because you know you've seen i've seen dozens of uh, you know m many a dozens of falcon 9 rockets and there's nothing really if it, if it didn't have humans in it it would just been an, an another like like the starlink that just went up yes last night um you know but knowing that there are humans on board this was a historic incredible launch and uh you know, I watched the uh, stream on them docking with the ISS and, and uh, all that. So uh, it'll be really incredible. And, of course, once they eventually touch down in the Atlantic Ocean, um, you know, I've been telling people they're doing it old school style like they did with the Apollo rockets, <laughs> you know. Um, that would be incredible. I was talking to my friend. And I was saying, hey, uh, do, you think, do you think they're going to have chartered boats <laughs> that are going to go out there and uh, – we can watch the uh, capsule land in the ocean, but I, I don't think I don't I don't know if that's going to happen. But, but that'd be kind of cool if it was, right? Yeah, Maybe absolutely. One Maybe one yeah. day. Yeah. <laughs> well, Derek, it's been great chatting with you. And can you share with everybody listening how they can follow you or get yeah, connected? Sure. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, so, uh, so as I said, I'm with the Emmobiler Planetarium. Um, if you, and all you have to do is just Google um, Seminole State College Planetarium, and you know you'll see our web address. It's basically www.seminolestate.edu/planet, or you can look us up on Facebook. Um, just type in Emmobiler Planetarium or Seminole Planet. Uh, all one word, Seminole Planet, and you can see our, our list, our link there. We actually do virtual uh, public shows and star parties. We actually have one going on tomorrow night at uh, 8 p.m. So if you like this, you'll definitely like uh, what we do. Um, so there's lots of really amazing space stuff going on, even with the uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so definitely support your your space enthusiasts and and, and fo follow along. And uh, for me personally, if you're interested in my astrophotography, I have an Instagram page, Derek the Discoverer, at Derek the Discoverer. It's all one word. Um, and not only do I post my astrophotography, but I also post my fossil finds and my rock finds and all the other places I go and adventure. Just kind of like sign where, as she said earlier, we're, uh, we're geo explorers. So um, I love that. So uh, definitely never stop exploring. That's all, that's that's the motto that I follow. Um, good friend of mine uh, has that motto, and I uh, I follow that every day. Oh boy, is, is that Antonio Paris? <laughs> that is Antonio. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, he's a good friend it of is. mine too. Yeah, so. he's, he's a cool guy. Yeah, yeah. He's been on Space Snacks, so yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so again, great seeing you. I um, can't wait to come visit in Florida yeah. eventually. And I know Antonio is down there um, mm -hmm. and some of our other friends, but really, I want to go fossil hunting with you. Are you scuba certified? Sam? I am. All right. Well, then we, we'll, we'll take you to the, the, these spots. We'll get you some meg teeth and some other cool stuff. It sounds perfect. Can't wait. And for everybody watching, thanks again. Space Snacks is every Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. And uh, I appreciate your support. So spread the word. Thanks. Have a great day.